All right. Well, welcome to Roots Reality Experiences. Today I'm joined by Russ Jaguer, who is an original member of the legendary Grammy-nominated and multi-platinum selling band, The Association. Lastly, Russ is also the co-author of the book, Along Comes the Association, Beyond Folk Rock and Three-Piece Suits. So Russ, thanks for coming on today. My pleasure. So when did you first get interested in music? Well, when I was a kid, I was uh, uh, in, my aunt was an Arthur Murray instructor and she taught me to dance real early. And I said, do I really have to learn this stuff at no And she said, Russell, you'll be glad you do, you know it. <laughs> and I always was, but I always loved music. I loved, um, I learned songs off the radio when I was a kid. Yeah. Red Top, Cowboy Joe and Rag Bop and <laughs> stuff like that. And uh, when folk music came out, I loved folk music. So I learned folk music and became a folk singer. And then um, then I joined, then I was asked by Terry Kirkman and uh, Jules Alexander to join the men. I said, the men was a group of 11 guys. <laughs> I, thought, I said, I really have never heard you guys. You're 11 guys, that's so big. And he said, well, come out and hear us. So I went out and heard them. They were great. So I quit my job at the Ice House and joined the men. A few months later, they had a meeting. And we were, it was the first uh, folk rock. It was uh, electric bass, drums, and such, electric guitars, and uh, acoustic guitars, both. Uh, so anyway, we, uh, I replaced the guy that, that left to join the Christie's. He left to replace Barry McGuire, who had gone on his own. And uh, so and then we re used to rehearse on, uh, at, on Large Rock, which is uh, on the edge of Hollywood. And uh, this upstairs uh, place that has a proscenium stage. We we rehearse on that stage, and uh, one day a, a guy, one of the guys, called a meeting. So we all stopped rehearsing, and we went in this office. And uh, this guy <laughs> was very talking mostly to Terry Kirkman. He said, "Terry, you're you're supposed to talk to this guy in this state, and this such a, this such a guy and this." Such, and they were going on and on. I had no idea what he was even talking about. I was sitting there, sitting there thinking, what's this about? You know, now and Jules was sitting right next to me. He said, all of a sudden he said something, he goes, I'm tired of this bullshit. I just want to make music. I'm out of here. <laughs> and I said, Well, you know, I gotta go with Jules. You know, I don't even know what you're talking about. I gotta walk out. Two guys across the room got to walk out to Ted and uh Brian Cole, uh, a guy named Jim Page. And Terry said, you know, you just lost your band. And so I walked out, we all walked down the stairs and went, went out on the sidewalk. Terry's, Terry's house was the closest. So we went to Terry's house, picked a name. Um, we started rehearsing the next day. And all of a sudden we went, we were, all of a sudden we went from folk rock to rock. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was real bizarre. So like I, I was a real good dancer. I mean, I, I never danced in the band because I didn't want to upstage the band. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't want to take I, over. I was a yeah. real good dancer. But uh, so I had gone from rock and roll to folk music to folk rock back to rock and roll. Wow. Jeez. Yeah. So we decided uh, the suits, because everyone was going to street clothes. Mm -hmm. So we figured we'd do we'd be taken more seriously if we dressed in three piece three piece uh, suits. So we did. So uh, we rehearsed for five or six months, got our sound all together, gave ourselves we gave ourselves two years to get a top forty record. If at the end of two years we didn't have a top forty record, we we were going to just split up and go back to to life, whatever we were doing. Oh wow! And, uh, 
within a year and a half, we had a top, top 10 record we, with Along Comes Mary, so, which was a B-side. Somebody had flipped it. And as they say in the business, it had legs. <laughs> so it, uh, it went to, I think, number seven. And then we released, our next release was Cherish, which Nick went to number one. So this was a year and a half in. So we were, we were on schedule, we stayed together. <laughs> our next album uh, that we did, uh, Renaissance, our first album was called uh, Along Comes the Association. Our second album was called Renaissance, did nothing, did nothing at all. And, uh, but our third album, I don't want to get into any details, but our third album had two hits on it, two number one hits. Uh, yeah. Never My Love and Wendy. And besides Requiem, which was a, a, a hit on the radio, you know, it was mm -hmm. a, never a single, but it was, I think it was a B side. I can't really remember, but it got a lot of airplay because it was a, sort of an anti-war song. Yes. Vietnam yeah. was going then. Boy, I was scared. I was scared as I was going to Nam. So uh, I ended up uh, being one Y. So that was good. Yeah. Well, when you came up with the song, yeah, you produced the song Requiem of the Masses, and you released it. Were you guys worried that there would be some like criticism for releasing an anti-war song or? No, nah, we really didn't care. We didn't think yeah. about it. We didn't even think about it. Yeah. yeah. We really didn't. You know, yeah. most, uh, it just got a lot of positive reaction. There were a few people that were, I'm sure, thought negatively of it. Right. But I was never right. aware of any negative feelings of it. But I'm sure the worst, as there were a lot of people who felt real positive about the war. Yeah. How you could feel positive about that war was a little beyond me. <laughs> yeah. World War yeah. II was a different thing. Sure. You know, my dad and uh, people like him saved the world. Yeah. In Vietnam, we weren't saving the world. Right, right. The French even warned us, don't go in. They People have been fighting for hundreds of years. Yeah. Yeah, so a friend of mine had a, a shop down uh, in Venice, uh, an antiques place and stuff like that. And he had a bookcase and, and, and the, not a bookcase for magazines, you know. And there's one magazine that had a cover of a soldier with a, a girl in the basket, sitting in the basket. I thought it was an American soldier with a Vietnamese girl in the basket. Mm. It was a French soldier. The French who had told us not to go in, <laughs> you know, because they had already tried and left. So uh, that's so much for that. And then yeah. we could see John and we, had uh, we released uh, everything that touches you went to number ten. We had a few top forties. It was great. We I tell you, as a stage act, there was none better. The band we we used to have meetings when we were getting together on Thursday nights. Just the guys, no management, no no nobody else. Just the guys, and we had decided to. Uh, be at least as good or better than our records and we were yeah so we we love we love performing live we we worked and we did we've done concerts in every state the band's still together they did like 70 concerts last year yeah yeah i, <laughs> I so I, yeah. I i retired from the band in i think 2013 2013 at the end of it I do. I just my my voice is is not of association quality any longer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but now I now I run the band. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm the uh, the guy. I sign the checks. I make the deals. Yeah, so I shoot the people. <laughs> no, right. I don't do any. I just yeah, run, the run the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fun. That's awesome. Um, you know, when you guys first started the association. How competitive was the music scene at the time? Well, it was real funny. A, a lot of people said, you know, there's no work. You know, there's, and it's real hard to find work. 
we worked our asses off. We'd, we'd, work, a, we'd work a club and our manager would bring down people from schools to see the band. So we were doing, a, working a club for a week during the, during the evening and we do one, two or three schools during the day. So we were working like great. We had, we had our own apartments long before we had a single, long before we had recorded. We were in LA, we were working out. We were just very well. We had, we learned real fast that our sound system was really important. We'd work, we'd do a gig and you have three mismatched mics, mis, mis, mismatched speakers, everything was just horrible. So we went to shore, we got a double shore sound system. A regular sound, shore sound system was two uh, six foot tall, tall skinny speakers. So we got uh, a double system, four speakers. And uh, we used that for a couple of years. It was great, it was a great, uh, no matter where we went, we always had a good sound system. Uh, it was, you know, they, they had uh, a thing that controlled the vocals called the brain. <laughs> and it was great. We had, we could, we could do probably up to seven or 10,000 people with, with that sound system. So it was great. A lot of people thought we were, we were singing to uh, pre recorded stuff. We never were. We were just, we were just good. Yeah, that's, yeah, just practice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're just good. We're, I'll tell you, I love doing concerts. It was great fun. Yeah. I love doing concerts. I love talking to the people. It was, it was just, it was just a great time. Was there a particular like age range of people that you were trying to promote your music to, or is it just not anyone really? That would uh, just mostly our own age range. Although we we got younger to older. Mm, okay. From, from kid, young teens to people in their 40s and 50s who are amazed at our vocal sound. Yeah. So uh, we, we appeal to a lot of people. You know, it's great fun. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's cool because I guess it's, it's challenging for probably a lot of groups historically to appeal to that range of people. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and not very many groups can say they've worked in every state yeah <laughs> true yeah we when we, we i was only in the band from 65 to 70. so when we started again we did a show called then and now which terry worked on the staff and they said to terry do you think the band would be interested in doing this, this show you know get together just for the show and terry said i don't think so that was in 79. So Terry said, I don't think so. <laughs> so Terry, Terry approached us all individually and every guy said no. So they doubled this, they doubled the offer. Wow. And they said, you can rehearse on the weekends, you only have to do five tunes. So everybody then said yes. So we did it. It was just wonderful. The, the first rehearsal guys were in tears. I mean, it was so beautiful. Yeah, so uh, we did the show, and everybody went back to their lives, and uh, it, it started. It made waves. A lot of people started wondering if they could hire us for concerts, or work their clubs and stuff. And so uh, we took a bank loan so we could get some threads, some clothes. Oh wow! And uh, McCurry had all the right amps and instruments. And we went from 1980, we went on the road till now. So from 80 to, the only slowdown really was when 9-11 happened, yeah. everything stopped. I mean, right. it just stopped. I'd never not worked. That was 9-11, nobody worked. Yeah, you know, yeah. It was all over. So, uh, but other than that, we we've worked every year, you know. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. Now, do you remember like the first time you heard uh, the association's music on the radio? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, we were in Santa Monica. We were about we were going to take a big. We had worked real hard on this album, 
and we're working or come, we're going to go out and spend time in the desert just to relax. And all of a sudden, along comes Mary came on the radio. And guys jumped out of the car, we're dancing in the street, and it was great. It was just exciting. It was, you know, it was neat to hear us on the radio. It was great. Did you guys like, like how early on as a, as a band did you realize that you guys could be really successful together? Well, we thought we were going to do it. I remember people would ask, people would ask me, why do you, how do you, how do you uh, think you're going to make it? Why do you think you're going to make it? And I would tell them, we're, well, we have nice music. We sing well together. Maybe we stand as good a chance as anyone else and better than most because we're real, we're all real smart, you know, and we're all real talented. And I was right. We were all real smart and real talented. And we made it. We sold 70 million records. Yeah. And we had discipline. And and also, we also had a work ethic, which we never talked about because we all had it. Yeah. You know, so I didn't realize until after I left the band and I, I tried to put together some bands things. Like, What's missing here? And what was missing was work ethic. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. Some guys would, you know, like half the band would have it, half the band wouldn't, half the band just expected to make it. Yeah. And you got to have a work ethic. I, but I love I loved hearing, like I, I remember hearing, uh, I heard him at the, at the uh, Troubadour. They were, uh, anyway, and then several weeks later, I heard them on the road, on the radio. Mm -hmm. It was great. Yeah. I'm from Springfield. Oh, okay. Yep. All right. They were great. When yeah. I heard them at the True, they had been together four days. Oh, my gosh. You know, and they were just good. They were yeah. just good. So I was impressed. And I saw I saw a lot of great actors at the True. Yeah. You know, I saw the MFQ. The modern folk quartet, which was was like they never had a gigantic success, but they were everyone's favorite group. The lights would come up during the week when they were working <laughs> in a nightclub, and everybody who wasn't working was in the audience. Yeah, you know, it was great, great group. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I that's... saw them when they did when they did a, the troubadour. They they just nailed people to the wall. They were so good. It was just so good. Just, just, just four guys just sang and played real well. Yeah, that's that's. I'm sure you got to interact with yeah all sorts of famous groups given all your guys' oh, yeah, success. Yeah. I mean, we, were, we, we first uh, we went on the road. The first group we went on the road with was the Love and Spoonful. That was great fun. Yeah, because we always liked their music and. And we got along with the guys real well. The crew was a little rough cut. <laughs> the crew was a little rough cut. And uh, they were challenging, oh, they were all the time challenging our crew with you. Yeah. Our crew was actually very tough, but they didn't, they didn't, they weren't rude. These guys were rude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, uh, let's see, you know, the association produced so many hit songs in the yeah, 60s yeah. And, and you know what are the challenges of trying to produce hit song after hit song because i know so many bands struggle and you know obviously there's many bands that can only produce maybe one hit song and that's it we call them one hit wonders yep that's right <laughs> uh well we were just, uh, part of it was luck part of it was drive part of it was discipline you know we uh we when we did windy uh, we worked on it uh, all day. All day we did the vocals. And uh, the idea was to make a perfect record. So I heard, I heard this story one day. We were working with uh, a symphony in Detroit, the, the Detroit Symphony. So the, uh, he, the conductor said, oh, let's take a break. So I said, Russ, can I talk to you? I said, sure. He said, I studied with uh, Bernstein in New York, studied conducting. He'd greet, the, he'd greet the class every day at the door. Then one day he didn't greet the class at the door. He was sitting at his desk and he had a portable record player sitting at his desk. And when everyone was seated, he 
they opened the record player and put on Windy. And when he played Windy, he said, and he said to the kids in the class, the kids, <laughs> the young people in the class, that now that is a perfect record. I this as good, as good a compliment as I could have from as high a source as I could think of. You know, but he's right. It is a perfect record. <laughs> you know, well, we worked hard to make it so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's pretty clear. I mean, it's. Uh... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's when, so when, when Bernstein says, now that's a perfect record, I would pretty well go with his, his assumption. Yeah, that's a good sign, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, obviously, I guess you guys, you know, had some songs that you could have, you could have had, but you decided to pass on. I remember you mentioned oh, yeah. in your book, like uh, Get Together by the Young Bloods. Oh, we, we, we did that long before the Young Bloods. They, they, Releasing that hit you know, so we we put yeah. it on our live album just because we had done it. We had stopped doing it for a long time. Yeah. But we put it on the album just to put it on the album because we used to do it. Yeah. It's a good version on the album. It's nice. It's a it's a great tune. Gino Valenti wrote it. Yeah. Yeah. And so how do you decide like which songs you really want to to stick we wrote with? Them. We wrote them. Okay. <laughs> we, uh, we, it was, it, we, <laughs> it was called a lynching. <laughs> yeah. We'd sit down with a bunch of demos. We just listen to tune after tune after tune. Yeah. Most songs lasted, I would say, eight bars. <laughs> and you hear somebody go, next. <laughs> yeah. But some, some tunes just bam automatically. Yeah. Uh, Long Comes Mary was never even voted on. It was such a good song. Yeah. Jules, our uh, lead guitarist, played uh, bass on the demo. And he brought it back to the group house where four of us lived. Two other guys lived with one guy lived with his wife, one guy, Terry, lived with the lady who would later become his wife. But four of us lived in a house together. Me and Jules and Ted and Jim. So Jules brought a demo of the song, Along Comes Mary, from the demo session, played it, said, listen to this song, put it on the record player, and we went, holy moly, I've never heard a song like that. And we all felt, we all did, we all just started working on it. Then the next day when we started rehearsing, we played it for the other guys, and they had the same reaction. Great song, we just started working on it right then. No vote, no anything. Just it's a great song. That's fascinating. Are there yeah. any songs that like you wish you guys would have kept and held on to or <coughs> excuse me? Um not really uh, we had a uh, you know we did the tunes we did because the, they fit the band. Yeah. You know. Even when Cherish was first played for the band, Terry played it for the band, and, and the guys went, mm, I don't know. So he <laughs> woodshed it about a week and worked with Jules and a couple other people, came back and played the song again. And went, oh, yeah, that's not, yeah, that'll do it. So, so, so uh, the uh, Chrissy Minstrels had already recorded the song. Oh, my gosh. So they, brought Terry in to get a license to release it. Terry said, no, I'm not going to give you a license. We're going to record it. Said, and the, the management says, well, who the hell are you? And Terry said, well, we're going to release it anyway. We're going to record it and release it. And they, and they told Terry, you'll never work in this business again. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Oh, I imagine that's what they said to Barry McGuire when he left. Right. <laughs> you know, and it had his own career. But it was great. It was, uh, it was, and also, it was one of those tunes that the audiences, after we do a show, would say, when are you going to record Cherish as a single? Because mm -hmm. it always got the same reaction. The audience would just sit in stone, just silence. You know, Cherish is a word. And they just, 
and then they break into tremendous applause. But uh, that about ninety percent of the time, that was before we ever recorded it. He would go, would just sit in stunned silence, and then they'd applaud. That was always <laughs> reacting to the tune. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, they uh, our uh, publishing company got some. Uh, have you ever heard Precious and Few? Mm -hmm. That's a Terry Shrimp. The, the, the publishing companies asked this guy, write me a Cherish. So he took and just changed the melody a little bit, wrote, wrote another, never was quite as big as ours. And the recording didn't have the arrangement of ours. But we did a, we did a giant, a giant, uh, it was a river fest. It was gigantic. Okay. Thousands of people. And the band, Climax was the band that recorded that. And Terry would never never say anything about it. He, 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 number one, you can't sue your own publishing company. So, so there was we did cherish, and afterwards there was a big silence. And I went, and we were playing. We were put, climax had had done gone on before and done it, and then they had done pressure to view. So during that silence, I went, pressure to view that. <laughs> yeah, on my Terry would never do that. He's too much of a gentleman. I am not. <laughs> but oh they, my um, gosh! And we we worked also with one band that did had a song. It was a big black band. They had a a song called Cherish, and we were opening for them. And uh, they they did Cherish got kind an of okay reaction, but our Cherish got the usual reaction: the silence, and then the Gigantic, you know, ovation. So it was, it was just a, it's just a powerful tune and a powerful arrangement. You know, and I love doing it. It's, a, it's at the top and bottom of my range. Yeah, so I've never been able to just throw it off, just sing it. I've always had to think about it. You know, because it's really, really at the top and bottom. So yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah, and it's got um, great tenor lines. Great tenor. Oh, lines. for sure. Yeah, it's one of the classics. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's a great song. Very few songs have that have an arrangement like that. Yeah. Now, at one point, I guess you had left the association to start a solo career and stuff. Can you tell me about? Well, I just what... left the association. I didn't leave to start it. So oh, okay, okay. Career. I just left, and then after. Doing nothing for about six months, I went, I better start a solo career. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you know? All right. Because I, I was getting real self destructive. So I have too much energy to yeah. be left, you know, to left doing nothing. So I uh, put, did an album. Me and, me and uh, a man, a, our manager at the time, Pat Coleccio, talked to Joe Smith. And he said I could do an album. So I did. Okay. Yeah. And so what made you want to take a break from the association then? Well, we were having a meeting and in the middle of this meeting, so one of the guys said, well, Russ goes, goes and he wears shorts in first class and then, then, then something like that. And I went, are you, are you kidding me? There's a war on it. You're talking about shorts in first class? And you know, and, and we were, we were doing, it was quite a, quite a long meeting. We were uh, Deciding how long how how long a notice we would give if we did leave. And so I sat there and this really bothered me. This guy was so about 20 minutes later, I said, How long how advance notice do I have to give? How long it, it, if I want to leave the group? It said six months. I said, Well, you got my advance notice. And I walked out. Wow. Because it just pissed me off. Yeah, yeah. It just pissed me off. Yeah. No other reason. I wasn't angry at anybody else. So uh so I left the group. Yeah. I didn't think anything of it. Well, yeah, I mean that seems like <laughs> isn't like that very, funny? Yeah, well hey, it's funny because it's like kind of like these little things that can set yeah, people yeah. off. It was the straw that broke the camel's back. Right. It was, well, it was so inconsequential. Yeah. So stupid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I imagine though, because like this is very common with all bands though, where they are constantly breaking up or changing members, uh, just because when yeah. you're around people so often, I guess you kind of get, you know, get tired after a while. Yeah, we, we only actually changed one member, Jules left before our second album, after our second album, and then was replaced by Larry Ramos. That was the yeah. only change we made. Yeah, okay. And after I left, they replaced two members with two members. They brought in a keyboard player and a bass player. And they never had another hit. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's interesting. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is as a band, do you, is there like a point in time where you kind of feel like, okay, well, you know, it's going to be hard to produce another hit where you've gone so long where it's like, okay, let's just keep with what we have and just, you know, stop working on new music or. Uh, I never thought that way. No, it is that way. Yeah. I guess it just kind of happened. I never thought of it. I just, I love doing the shows. We always did great shows. Yeah. And, uh, uh, when I left, we had just done the greatest, put together the greatest hits album. And that went, went gold. And then I was gone about a year and it went platinum. Yep. Then after I was gone two years, it went double platinum. <laughs> <laughs> so, You're pretty good, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And goodbye, Columbus, of course. Which I thought this, they released Goodbye Columbus from the movie, which is a movie track. They released Goodbye Columbus as a single. I always thought there was a student called Gotta Be Real. And I always thought they should have released that as a single, mm. which would have been a hit single on its own, which would have but it was still a hit movie anyway. And uh, But I was like, that, that song better. But yeah. Such is life, my son. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, that happens. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm curious then, you know, thinking in the big picture now, you know, what are the biggest ways you think that music has changed since the association formed in the 60s? Well, it seems to be more competitive and it seems to be a lot less musical. Mm, okay. I, uh, I hear a lot of machine music. I hear a lot, and a lot of rap. Yeah. I don't hear as much music, you know, real, a lot of stuff sounds the same. Yeah. You know, it just sounds the same. It just sounds like crap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's some great stuff still there. There's yeah. always great stuff. But uh, a lot of it isn't great stuff. It's very disappointing. But uh even when we were when we had hits, there were a lot of people who just they tried to sound like other people. We never tried to sound like anybody. Yeah. But I'm convinced if Cherish had been the first hit, I don't think Along Comes Mary would have been a hit. Because once they heard that big sound, that big vocal sound, that's what they expected. Uh, we okay. did, all the tunes are so different. I mean, Mary, Cherish, Never My Love, Windy. Everything that touches you. Yeah. Uh, you put those together, they don't even sound like the same band. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because because that's just the way we were. You know, we just did the music for the we did we did songs we liked and we did the song for the song. You know, we did the just the arrangements we did were for the song. Right. What we felt the song called for. So we, I think we had a little different uh, approach than most people. And like I say, we voted on almost everything. Yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, I guess that's, that's something I never really thought about. But yeah, I mean, if depending, I guess, on what songs come out at what time can impact how people perceive the music. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a lot of, we had a lot of, uh, a lot of people. I heard us refer to it as a bubblegum group. That really take a bubblegum group? Are you <laughs> kidding me? Bubblegum groups don't do Requiem for the Masses. 
<laughs> carriage, you know, the kind of songs we did. Right. You know, it was, I, I consider that real insulting. Bubblegum is the RGs. <laughs> but we, we were never a bubblegum group. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I never, I never got that impression either listening to your music. So I, I agree. Yeah, good. <laughs> you, you got the proper impression. <laughs> But we were proud of what we did, and we we were, like I say, we were really a great band live. Yeah, we did we did at least two hundred like two hundred two hundred fifty shows a year. Yeah, so we traveled a great deal, and we were really good. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people didn't like us once they saw the band liked us. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, just we were just good. I loved us. Right. Yeah. And I don't like anything. But, and we, because I think because we came from folk music, we talked to the audience. We did comedy bits. We did all kinds of things like that. You know, so we we're a little different than most bands. It wasn't just one guy t twisting and shouting in front of an audience with, with a band play. Right. Yeah. You know, we really, we really were a little more complex than that. Yeah. Well, I think that's always important for bands to kind of have that personal touch with their audience and show that yeah, they want yeah. to interact with them, um, yeah. not be robotic. Yeah. Although we had, did have a bit called the machine bit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, which was a famous bit we had. We did for a couple of years. It was a great bit. But, I mean, it's been amazing to see just how the association just keeps going and going and going. Um, I mean, I've seen the association in concert. I saw, I think I saw you perform when I was a kid, actually. So wow, cool! Uh, it's uh, it's kind of amazing how it's just become a kind of multi generational group where people yeah yeah can hear it forever. It seems. <laughs> well, our stuff is standards. They 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 came out when the when the millennium changed. They came out with a list of the uh, the hundred most played tunes of all time. Yeah. Yeah, and we had three of them. Yeah. We had the second right. most played tune, 27 and 45 or something like that. But it was great. I, I was amazed. Uh, one, of, one of the uh, Dreechi brothers who wrote Never uh, Never My Love told me about it. In fact, he sent, he sent me a copy of the, uh, the list, which I carried with me for a long time. I carried the list. <laughs> it was so impressive. That's awesome, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, looking back at your career and the association, you know, when you first started the group, did you ever imagine what it would become and how famous it would be? I didn't, I thought we would be successful, but I didn't, I didn't know it would be this successful. Right. Yeah, you know, but uh, it was great that it turned out like this. I was like, at the fact that we were six guys so the music was more famous than we were. Yeah. Generally, yeah. you know, because it, it was it's hard to remember to Scott. But I, that never bothered me. It never bothered me. I never I never cared about being famous. I just I just wanted our music, but I did want our music to be famous. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's what it's all about, I guess, at the end of the day. Yeah, it's yeah, about yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not a standard, but our music is a standard. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, you'll you'll hear cherish it long after we're all gone right people will be listening to cherish and windy and never my love and i'll everything that touches you all these tunes will still be getting play oh definitely yeah it's yeah, a part of they're, they'll become now, what yeah. it's called standards yep that's yeah. right i mean that's it's a critical piece of the history of music now so <laughs> yeah i consider i consider myself lucky to have been part of it absolutely um Let's see, I have one more question for you. Uh, just want to throw out there. What is something that, uh, about the association that most people don't know? Hmm. Wow. Because I know you've written books and there's been several books about the group, but you know, what's something that's still out there that's still mysterious to people? They don't, they don't realize it or something. I really don't know. Uh, we, there was a point in our career, this is in the book, where three of us carried guns. Okay. 
I carried a 32 automatic. Yeah. Jules carried a snub nose 38, and Brian carried a 45. Now, when I first, when I wrote it in the book, there were guys at the band who had never we didn't carry these because for any egotistical person mm -hmm. reason, we carried them because it was dangerous. Okay, yeah. It was a scary time. Some of the guys in the band confessed to me, said to me, we didn't even know you had carry guns. <laughs> yeah, but there was a time when three of us did. And we, we never thought about Larry B. Oriental. And I remember we were at a party, the group, and a guy came up to me, walked up and asked me this, that China boy with you? Yikes. That China boy with you? And I turned to him and I said, yeah, he's my business partner. Why? And he just walked away. But uh, oh, wow. it, was, it was pretty bizarre. Yeah. So, uh, that wasn't really the reason we cared. But they, they brought in, um, they started bringing in metal detectors and stuff like that. So we stopped carrying them. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. but we never flashed them. We never showed them. They weren't there for any macho reason. Right. They were there. So if anything went down, if anything went down, we were going to come out on top. Yeah. You know, it was just a scary time. It was a scary time. In some yeah. places. Not yeah. Place. Well, I mean, yeah, it's historically, I mean, that was an era where there were, you know, lots of high profile assassinations and oh, yeah, um, yeah, all yeah. sorts of stuff going on. So well, lots of crime. Would, and in my book, I tell the story. If people didn't like you, like you rent a rent car, then you go and gas up. You'd ask the directions to the gig. If they didn't like you, they tell you the wrong directions. If they didn't like the way you looked, or <laughs> so. At one time, we were, we were totally lost. A guy, the gas station attendant, and just not liked it. So we said, "Well, first people we see." We'll ask them where this is. First people we see in a we're in a neighborhood. So we saw some kids on the porch. So we stopped and went up. They, uh, they were playing the they were they had a record player on the porch, a portable player, and they were they were playing our album. So it was great. This is, these kids were playing our album on the porch. So we asked them the directions and you know, their parents came out and we had a great time. It sure blew their minds. It blew our minds. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> it's a cool coincidence. The guy had just given us wrong direction purposely. Yeah. My last question for you then is, you know, uh, <coughs> what advice would you give then to, you know, future musicians about, you know, how to be successful? Well, uh, just do good songs. Uh, stay with it. Have your own sound. Be unique. Uh, and give yourself a timeline. You know, don't just stay together no matter what goes on. Like we gave ourselves a two-year timeline. Yeah. If we had made it in two years, we would have done another other thing. But just uh, have faith in what you're doing and, and have a work ethic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a that's something we never ever discussed, and we had it major. Yeah, we yeah. had a work ethic. We, like I said, we rehearsed for like five or six months. Not that every band has to rehearse five or six months, right? But for us, we did. Yeah, yeah. Good advice for the music business, but also good advice for life in general. So, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Perfect. Well, thank you, Russ, so much for taking the time to come on and share your experiences and all this fascinating, cool history. So I really appreciate it. Well, I'm glad it. you liked it, Ben. <laughs>